My name is Alex Mullen. I'm the director of security for LaunchDarkly. And today I'd like to talk about building effective security OKRs. When I interview security folks, I ask, why did you get into security? There's no right answer, but I usually learn something. One common answer I get is, I got into security because security is so dang cool. Secret codes, exploits, hacking, knowing about security gives you superpowers. I think security is cool. And if you're listening to me, you probably agree. Security teams are groups of people who think different parts of security are cool. One person may be into game console hacking. Another gets excited about the latest, greatest configuration of TLS. Someone else likes compliance. Okay, nobody thinks compliance is cool, but you get my point. Not everyone thinks security is cool. You've worked with these people. You can usually tell who they are because they don't have the word security in their title. These people may think security is scary or worse, an unnecessary distraction. This may be most people in your organization, even the leaders. These people don't think security is cool, but they know security problems are very uncool. Leaders like this see that other organizations have security teams. They guess they should have a security team. So they hire a bunch of people that have security in their title. What happens next? If there's no strategic direction, you'll have at best organic and tactical security improvements. At worst, you'll have chaos. You want a security team to work together and the rest of your organization to cheer you on. You need to agree on your team's goals. Once you've agreed on clear goals, you can determine how good your security team is at meeting them. It's not an easy thing to do. Your sales team has revenue. Your finance team has profits. Sure, revenue and profits are important, but what about this new vulnerability that everyone's talking about? Should you spend time fixing it or building security training or hiring? Your security team will struggle if your goals are vague and you don't agree on how to measure impact. People on your team will work on whatever they're interested in because there's no clear mission. Other teams will avoid you because they don't understand how your work helps them. Your organization will have to hesitate to give you the time, money, and other resources you need because you won't be able to show them what they get in return. I'm gonna talk about how objectives and key results, or OKRs, can align our incentives. Using OKRs, your security team can do meaningful work that everyone in the organization values. I'll start with a brief discussion of what OKRs are and why they're important. Next, I'll talk about what good secu uh, security OKRs look like. Finally, I'll discuss our team's process for building effective security OKRs. OKRs are a management methodology that helps to ensure that the company focuses effort on the same important issues throughout the organization. Just like free lunch cafeterias and Kubernetes, OKRs spread through the tech ecosystem because Google uses them. Andy Grove developed OKRs at Intel and John Doerr brought them to Google. If you wanna learn more about OKRs, I'd recommend checking out their respective books, High Output Management and Me Measure What Matters. As a quick summary, OKRs have two parts, objectives and key results. An objective is a goal. And in, in the OKR system, it's important that you write down and communicate this goal. It should be significant, concrete, action-oriented, and inspirational. Key results map objectives to the outcomes required to reach them. Key results should be specific, time-bound, aggressive, realistic, measurable, and verifiable. You can apply OKRs to any situation. My objective for this presentation is to keep you engaged for a half hour about how to build security OKRs. 
I can measure that if there's a, secu- uh, a survey afterwards that asks the audience how engaging the presentation was. But I could have other objectives. If my objective is to raise my profile, then maybe I want to see increased LinkedIn connections. If I want to influence your behavior, then maybe I want to count the number of people following up saying how this talk changed their life. This presentation was an investment of time and effort. So uh, I could use OKRs to express what I want to see in return. Why are OKRs becoming more and more mainstream? John Doerr's book calls out four OKR superpowers for organizations. First, they help you focus on what's important. When you work at a software organization, there are hundreds of problems you could be solving. The pace of technology is a mile a minute, and there's always a new framework, process, or tool. OKRs reduce the number of things you need to do, uh, and they increase your focus. OKRs also make sure that teams stay connected. It's sort of like turn signals. OKRs let teams say where they're going so that other teams can follow or get out of the way. Without communicating, you end up with duplicative works or gaps. Key results pinpoint when and why you did or did not achieve your objectives. This drives accountability, which means opportunity for growth and learning. Finally, OKRs let you set your bar and expectations high. Google considers hitting only 70% of a key result a success. Setting tough goals improves performance. We all seek the same ability to overcome challenges and face adversity. Well-crafted OKRs give us the same hit of dopamine as we get from beating a tough video game. It builds engaged teams. The OKR process varies from organization to organization. Usually there's a quarterly cadence for planning and communication. You could have OKRs at the company, team, or individual level. During the quarter, you measure your progress. If the circumstances change, you may request a change to your OKRs. At the end of the quarter, you assess your performance and start the process over again. One way to build OKRs is to have cascading OKRs. Company objectives guide the formation of team objectives. Team objectives guide the formation of individual objectives. This ensures that company objectives remain in the forefront and drives focus. It can lead on missing out on insight from folks on the ground level. In my experience, some of the best ideas come from individual contributors. Even if you have cascading objectives, make sure to include bottoms-up ideas in your OKR plans. I assume you now believe in the power of OKRs, or maybe they're mandated for your organization. Either way, how should security teams use them? The first part of OKRs is objectives. What are some properties of objectives that are important for security teams? Security objectives should make sense to people outside the security team. They should support the organizational mission. I did some research for for this presentation by searching for articles about security OKRs. I ran across some objectives like improve the security of the web application. It's okay, but it's incomplete. How does that align with what people in your company who don't have security in their title actually want? I worked as the security lead at an education technology company called Clever. I was responsible for defining security strategy and measuring its effectiveness. Clever had a strong culture of OKRs. Our head of product came from Intuit and led a very well-organized, top-down OKR process. The executive team decided on the company top-level OKRs, and each team had cascading objectives that supported these high-level company goals. Security is a big priority at Clever. It holds over half the kids in the U.S.'s personally identifiable information. I still struggled to express what the security team was trying to achieve at a high level. One day, I was walking with the security team's product manager, and we had a breakthrough. What security outcome did we want? Zero high-severity security incidents. Despite its simplicity, the executive team bought into this, and Our team got a spot in the top-level company OKR spreadsheet. 
The next challenge was figuring out how to achieve that objective, but at least we knew we could build our roadmap with the destination everyone understood. Once you've figured out an objective, like zero high se severity security incidents is what matters, how do you achieve it? For me, it boils down to the most important concept in information security, risk. The probability that something bad happens and the cost that it has to the organization. It should be clear how security team objectives reduce risk. Remember the mismatch. The security team wants to work on cool security things. The rest of the company wants to prevent uncool security problems. Risk is the way to align these perspectives. Risk is like the physical laws of information security. It's the reality of what we're doing. Take an observation like that's a vulnerability and we should fix it. That's shorthand for a longer explanation. There's a probability a bad person who wants something could take advantage of this problem and cause us harm. And by fixing the problem, we can reduce that probability or reduce the harm they can cause us. Because the long form ideas are clunkier to express, they don't propagate through, but that means we lose a lot of valuable context for decision making. I was part of the original security team at Twitter, and for a time, I was responsible for account security. In those days, a lot of people's Twitter accounts were getting hacked. If someone with 10 followers had their accounts hacked, nobody cared. But if it was a celebrity, or even worse, an advertiser, people cared. The executives would summon us to the top floor in a war room where the minor crisis would play out. There were always the same obvious suggestions. Let's enable two-factor for everyone. Let's block everyone from logging in from a new country. Our team had dismissed these ideas as impractical many times before. This graph shows the idea that moved us forward. High value accounts are more valuable assets to the business. We should focus more account security risk reduction effort on them. If we're doing well, we will see fewer high value accounts compromised. This risk based perspective aligned us with the company. Reducing risk is likely going to be a primary objective of any security team, but there could be others. GitLab's information security team's mission is to be the most transparent in the world. Like the rest of GitLab, they make their internal documentation public in a handbook. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend you check it out. In their handbook, they talk about three team tenets. One is to secure the product by reducing the risk in what they ship to customers. The second is protect the company by reducing risk in their IT infrastructure. The third is to assure the customer, which isn't about reducing actual risk. Instead, assuring the customer is about reducing the perceived risk. Reducing actual and perceived risks are different objectives with different key results, but both align with top-level objectives. Reducing actual risk could reduce costs by preventing data breaches and outages. Reducing perceived risks for customers could enable sales and grow revenue. The organizations that use the Launch Darkly platform have high security standards. To assure them, we undergo ISO 27001 and SOC 2 security certifications. Most of the effort spent obtaining these certifications isn't about reducing actual risk. Instead, it's meant to meet the objective, objective of assuring the customer so that we can enable revenue goals. Sure, following these standards also reduces risk as a side effect, and that's fine. We can have initiatives that fulfill many objectives. In fact, having many objectives that balance each other out is a good thing. You don't want to achieve goals while ignoring harmful, uh, harmful side effects. One security team objective I've introduced at LaunchDarkly is to enable the rapid delivery of value. It's designed to be in tension with other objectives. We can reduce risk to zero. We can build the strongest customer assurance in the industry, but if we slow the product delivery team to a grinding halt, we failed. First, your team should determine the high level objectives that are unlikely to change. Reduce risk, assure the customer, and so on. 
Next, you can create quarterly objectives that have higher resolution, reduce risk by reducing the probability that we deploy a vulnerability, assure the customer by conducting a quarterly penetration test. Remember that these short-term objectives may map to many long-term objectives. As you start to create more concrete objectives, collaborate with other teams. See if security can tag along with other objectives like reliability or efficiency. Learn about what other teams are doing. There may be plans to update a database platform or move to containers. Make sure you're taking opportunities to reduce risk while systems are being designed and built. If you want to build a successful security team, make sure people want what you're providing. Think like a product manager. Instead of a company-wide company rollout of a cumbersome new security tool, can you ship a minimum viable product, learn, and iterate? Security tools can balloon CI build times. Can you have an objective around developer experience? Can you send out NPS surveys after your threat modeling exercise? Would other teams recommend your security team to other people? These kinds of objectives provide a good tension with your risk reduction objectives. They ensure you have a sustainable relationship with the rest of your organization. Getting objectives right for your security team is a high leverage investment. I like this quote from Michael Zalewski's blog about getting product security right. He talks about making sure the security team sees the big picture. Rather than focusing on tactical objectives and policy documents, try to write down a concise mission statement explaining why you're a team in the first place, what specific business outcomes you're aiming for, how do you prioritize it, and how you want it all to change in a year or two. How do you track your journey to achieving objectives using key results? If you don't set clear milestones, you can end up spinning your wheels with projects that don't have impact. A big success criteria for key results it should be clear when you hit them or when you don't. Vague key results are too open for interpretation. The process is documented or false positive rate is improved. If two people might disagree on whether you hit the key result, change it. Another problem I've seen is that key results sound good, but the metric isn't defined or tracked. Reduce vulnerabilities by 50%. If there isn't good vulnerability data, the key results sound good but aren't useful. These sound good key results can be a symptom of teams creating OKRs at the last minute. It's important to do pre-work for OKRs. Make sure that you have systems in place to measure what you intend to improve before you set the key results target. Sometimes it may be difficult to tie a key result directly to an objective. Your objective is to reduce the time to respond to high severity security incidents. You may not be able to measure that since high severity security incidents don't happen that often. You may have an initiative that spans many quarters or initiative where the work will have a delayed impact. In these cases, you can have key results that function as input metrics. Input metrics are often more binary. We will complete this project. If possible, you should see if there are better success criteria than completion. You're deploying a new static analysis tool. Your key result could be that at least some identified issues have been fixed. The idea is that input metrics help you decide if the initiative is successful, whereas output metrics help you decide if you are meeting the objective. In some cases, you might want to define both input metrics and output metrics for a key result. I've been partway through quarters and realized that our team is headed in the wrong direction. We should change our objectives. Or we're measuring the wrong thing, and we should change our key results. Or our initiatives aren't having the impact that we're expecting, and we should change our targets. A well-defined way to change an OKR process helps you stay agile and accountable. It's easy to get complacent in security. The overhead of finding and fixing bugs can keep you on the treadmill. It can prevent team members from growing their impact and their careers. 
define the direction you want to go with an objective and the criteria for what it looks like when you'll get there with the key result. You can set aggressive key results and give people ownership and autonomy to meet them. It's a great way to get creative solutions to problems, and it gets people engaged in their work. Another big failure mode with key results is to set and forget. If you don't track whether you hit your target, you won't improve. Discipline around planning might not extend into grading and analysis. You should track whether you hit key results and make that tracking public. You should seek to understand why you didn't hit the key results in order to improve. Based on these guidelines for effective objectives and key results, I'd like to walk through an example, OKR. This one should be familiar. You want to reduce the risk of a data breach by reducing developer-introduced vulnerabilities. There are some missing pieces here, like defining a data breach, but an objective like this should be uncontroversial. It ties the security team's work to top-level company goals. Okay, so how would you go about measuring whether you hit this objective? When I joined LaunchDarkly, I knew we wanted good security metrics. I encouraged us to track vulnerabilities in a consistent way. Vulnerabilities come in from a variety of data sources, and it can be difficult to correlate them. We needed a platform for vulnerability data. You can't measure vulnerabilities if you don't have consistent metadata. We use JIRA as a single source of truth for tracking vulnerability information. We created custom issue types with the required metadata fields. First, you have type, which is important to standardize. I found the Hacker One page called Types of Weaknesses to be a really good starting point. It uses a subset of the common weakness enumeration list. Next, you can use a severity scoring system, something like CVSS. We identify service and team to track trends in where our vulnerabilities exist. We also track what identified the vulnerability, bug bounty, pen test, et cetera. Finally, we track the time introduced, identified, and mitigated. Using these times, we can measure the speed of our vulnerability remediation efforts. To clarify how risk ties to vulnerabilities, we use standard titles for tickets. We state the problem, not the fix. We use the summary to describe the impact of the vulnerability. It should be of the form, this would allow an attacker to. Another important thing is to weed out potential vulnerabilities or weaknesses. We have a triage bug bounty program. We have regular manual penetration tests. These rarely turn up false positives. We also have vulnerability scanners across our layers, operating system, cloud, web, code, where we tend to see a lot of noise. We have a process for manual triage of these results to make sure that our vulnerability data ties to real rather than potential risk. Once we have good data, we can start to track metrics. Some examples of objective measurements we have include the time to detection of vulnerabilities, the time to remediation of vulnerabilities, the average vulnerabilities per time period, and we can slice and dice these by vulnerability type, uh, team, service, source. So our objective was to reduce the risk of a data breach by reducing probability of a developer introducing a vulnerability. We can now state our key result as a hard metric. We're going to reduce the average time until identification of vulnerabilities by 50%. This should reduce the probability of a data breach because we're able to detect the vulnerability before an attacker can exploit it. We can measure with a simple calculation. We sum the time deltas between the introduction and identification of a vulnerability and then take the average. If you have a single source of truth for vulnerability data, you can dump it to an analytics tool and create a dashboard that people can check on progress at any time. Having this well-defined key result makes the impact of initiatives much clearer. You want to implement a static analysis tool in order to reduce the time to find vulnerabilities. The OKR links this initiative with the top-level company goals. Sometimes you work backwards. You 
think that a security project is important. So then you describe what impact it will have with a key result and then figure out how that ties into objectives. It works the same in reverse. Another style of OKR you could consider is to use risk itself as a metric. Measuring risk isn't a new concept, but I think it's still underused. I found a couple of resources useful for understanding how to operationalize risk as a metric. One is the book, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk. I wanted to share some key concepts I took away from it. Uh, the first, if your risk assessment is bad, your security is bad. Uh, so if risk assessment itself is a weakness, then fixing risk assessment is the most important patch a cybersecurity professional can implement. The second is that we are always doing probabilistic risk assessments, whether we know it or not. Those who think of probabilities as only being the result of calculations on data and not also a reflection of personal uncertainty are presuming a particular interpretation of probability. Also, objective data is best, but expert estimation, even with small amounts of incomplete data, is effective. Finally, rather than using risk matrices, high, medium, low, probability, and impact, you can measure risk as dollars. This gives you meaningful quantitative data that you can do math on. You can compare cybersecurity impact to other areas of the business. You can set budgets. This is hard to do when risk is abstract and subjective. Uh, I'd recommend this book, but it does get a bit dense. It's a, a foundational shift in how to think about cybersecurity risk. There are some templates on the website if you're looking to get started. Ryan McGeehan's blog posts on simple risk analysis are a more concise take. He describes how to measure risk with expert forecasting. He describes using expert estimation to forecast risk. First, you choose a risk to measure. Then you forecast values that describe it. Next, you mitigate the risk in some way. And finally, you forecast again, measuring your progress. He has another blog post about using this process to create OKRs. He suggests starting by writing an objective with a probabilistic risk scenario. An example scenario, an adversary accessing production from a developer laptop in Q3. You do a forecasting exercise and make the result your baseline. Now you can do your work, making progress as usual. At the end of the quarter, you do another forecasting exercise and compare it with the baseline. You can measure risk as a metric or use the language of risk to clarify impact. Either way, spend time documenting how your security work ties to risk. It's critical for effective OKRs. I hope you have a better idea now of what good security OKRs look like. I'd like to share our team's process for building our OKRs. First, we assess and do a postmortem on the previous quarter's OKRs. We discuss what worked and what didn't. This drives accountability and learning. If we didn't meet a key result, we may want to try again, or we may want to change it, or we may want to take a whole new approach. Next, I like to gather ideas from the team using a bottoms-up brainstorming exercise. I like to encourage people to gather ideas for things to work on for the next quarter beforehand. I remind them that to be good advocates for an idea, they should come prepared with data they should be able to show the impact of their proposed projects. During the brainstorming exercise, I get people to write down their ideas on post-it notes. Each person puts them on a wall, clustering related ideas. And after narrowing down our ideas to a set of common themes, we run a voting exercise. Each team member ranks their top five ideas. We then calculate the priority of each project according to the team. A good way to support this exercise is to do some pre-work. I've done a few different things you can try and see if either works for you. First, there's an informal risk exercise. I ask the team to come up with the most likely and impactful risk scenarios. What keeps people up at night? 
Where do we know we don't have adequate protections? What stories have we heard about trends that make us concerned? Prompting ourselves in this way can help frame the brainstorm. Another tip is to ask everyone on the team to read an article, book, or paper, or watch a video together. I've used the video of Clint Gibbler's An Opinionated Guide to Scaling Your Company's Security talk from AppSec Cali. It's a great compilation of talks from leading application security teams. This can help open you up to more ideas, leading to a more creative brainstorm. After our team's brainstorm, I reach out to other teams to get a sense of their quarterly OKRs. The DevOps or IT team are often leverage points for security efforts. Where possible, I like to establish shared objectives. I use the two sides of a bridge analogy. We agree to build out separate parts of a complementary project that meet in the middle. You deploy MDM, we configure the security policies in it. You build the observability dashboard, we add the authentication and access control layer. It's also a good idea if there are company-wide goals to ensure that you're aware of them and supporting them. Are there any new initiatives that need security focus? It may reduce our team's bandwidth. At this time, we should have the materials for a good first draft of OKRs. Since I have to make prioritization decisions, I need to decide what to cut. I rank the projects based on their impact and effort. There are two other things to consider. One is confidence. How likely is this to result in the impact we're expecting? Am I comfortable taking on a high-risk, high-impact project? The second is cost of delay. A risk that exposes the organization today is higher priority than something that prevents a future problem. As I prepare my draft OKRs, I make sure to document exactly what we plan on accomplishing. I've seen many OKRs that are just a few sentences. I like to write up the details. How does this objective tie to higher level objectives? Why did we focus on this objective over other objectives? How are we measuring the key result? How did we choose the target for the key result? I then communicate my OKRs to the organization for feedback and alignment. Once the OKRs are set, I start assigning ownership to the team. In my one-on-ones, I ask what people want to work on, what they think is cool. Then I assign them the responsibility for meeting the key result. It's a great way to build autonomy. At this point, the team starts documenting project plans. And as the quarter progresses, we have a monthly check-in on projects and key results. If it's clear we're not going to hit a key result, we consider changing it. The goal here is to create more and more predictable outcomes, which let us place bigger and bigger bets. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And now I'll answer any questions.